All right. This should be interesting, right? Like the great wisdom of the sage coming. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen, but we'll have a good journey. I've made some ch slide changes, and we'll see if I can react to that. Uh, but we're here to talk about... Uh, Actually, you know what? Uh, there's a couple of interesting things we could do probably right up front, right? Like, what is architecture? What is an architect? What do they do? What is this crazy thing, and why do I want to be one? <laughs> right? That's kind of the conversation we're going to have. Um, what is this architecture uh, or architect? I got a question for you. I know this is hard. I commonly will ask this question, and for some reason, everybody wants to deviate on where my mental model is on this. Uh, they want to say that the requirements weren't well known. I'm saying the requirements are well known. They're well understood. You have a bunch of user stories. You're doing a really cool agile development. Not only do you have really great requirements, you've got great user support. You've nailed what they've requested for you to do. Is it still possible for that project to fail? It is. Why? Love it. Love it. Everybody seems to have a different definition for an architect. I used to actually teach for Rational. I used to teach UML, OID. I usually apologize for that. <laughs> I was young and I needed the money. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I say that kind of jokingly. Uh, uh, there's some value in being able to express yourself. There's in tremendous value in being able to communicate and having a common notation, a common language to do that is paramount. It is so important. I can't express more how important that is. But to spend your time writing Word documents, to spend your time writing diagrams and, uh, uh, may not be the best use of your time. The point of communication is to bring clarity and vision. And then if you already have the vision, anything else is just an exercise in ceremony. And that would not be beneficial to our end goal, right? Now, with that said, we have nailed what my definition is for an architect. At some point for a project, you will have a bunch of non-functional requirements. You'll have a bunch of things that nobody tells you. They don't tell you. What are these things? What's an example of this? P performance? A lot of people like to go with performance. How about scalability? Like, your app works, it works exactly like it was advertised as the user wanted it, but it supports two people. <laughs> Assuming you want more than two people, that might not be good. <laughs> All right. So I added some thoughts in here, but um, it's not an accident, right? It's not an accident. This is an intentional thing. There's a, there's a path that we're on that we need to focus on. A lot of times when we think of architects, uh, one of the concepts and thoughts that come to mind, uh, uh, certainly you've worked with some, I assume, in the past, is this of an ivory tower architect. What is that? It, it seems to be, and with this large of a crowd, I usually like to engage with people. With this large of a crowd, I might not wait too long. Um, but this seems to be a person that seems to be out of touch with reality, right? They, they give you some requirements. They're like, you have to do this, and you're like, they don't even know. They don't even know they don't know, right? That's, that's really deep not knowing. <laughs> uh, oftentimes, they're kind of thought to be the wise, sandal-wearing, beard-growing you know, uh, type of person. And oftentimes, you get into these arguments with them, uh, it seems to be. Now, that would not be our goal, of course. But if you're going up and you have an issue with the defined architecture, you oftentimes have to build up factions, right? You can't just go alone. You're going to get all your developer friends to agree with you and go, well, the five of us should go and talk to his boss or his or her boss. Let's talk about the roles of architect. And it's, this is the best way I can kind of explain it, uh, and hopefully it works for you. Uh, first of all, I would say, as we talked about in the town hall, and I truly believe it, um, there's a huge difference between being a developer and an architect. And here's going to be your challenge, by the way, if this is the path that you're on. You may be a rock star, and I do think that's the right way to go. The right path to be on is to become excellent at a thing, to be a specialist. You want to go deep, because going deep can bring um, awareness to a number of things that you wouldn't have otherwise had because you're uh, an inch deep and a mile wide, right? That, if you go a mile deep, 
Now all of a sudden you have a greater context, a deep context of some things that can then uh, extend your thinking in other areas eventually when you get there. But here's one of the challenges that we face. Being really, really good as a developer oftentimes brings awareness to management and those in power that we should probably, you know what? You are amazing. I want five of you, right? <laughs> so you need to either have a bunch of kids really quick, <laughs> or I want you to lead a bunch of people. Now, listen to what just happened, right? You are now being asked to do something. You, you were amazing at something. And now you're being asked to do something that is really, really different. It is not uncommon to have an evaluation that says you should be promoted to be an architect, followed by another year or two an evaluation of, we don't know if you're really fitting in as well as we thought, right? <laughs> Because the skills are completely different. And you're going to be evaluated on past performance. And they're going to go, huh, wonder what's going on. And you're not going to receive training in it, right? You're going to either get it through osmosis, <laughs> which I don't believe in. Although Carducci has me really doubting a lot of things today. <laughs> right? The magician yes, uh, the other day. All right, so let's look at some roles. The first is... You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to understand things and understand things at different levels. I need to be able to look at schematics. I need to be able to look at system structure, logical views and physical views. These things I have to understand. It's kind of a requirement. You're probably exposed to it as a developer, which is great. Uh, you have different levels of abstractions. There's a couple of things that stand out uh, from my experience of people who are good at architecture. One of those things is actually relatively hard to find, and that is somebody who is a good abstractionist. And, and that usually leads to good encapsulation as well, but that uh, doesn't have to. But being a good abstractionist is a really important skill to have. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Understanding technology stacks. Now, what came up in the town hall is how can you know everything? Great question, by the way. Now that you're really good as a developer and you're going to stretch out and do architecture, here's what I do. Uh, I w there wasn't enough time to share all my thoughts at that moment. Um, here's what I do. I categorize things. For instance, Spring MVC, it's a request model MVC type thing. JSF, it's a component-based architecture. There are completely different ways of providing a, a web interface. When I see something new, I'm like, the general models that we tend to see are component-based or request-centric based. Which one is this? Sometimes it's slightly a guess. You're like, well, it seems to look like a request-centric based architecture. Somebody might even correct me and say, well, it kind of deviates in these ways. But categorizing things gives me tremendous uh, abilities or value. Right? That's super important to be able to abstract the thing of the tool set that you're looking at and say, it's kind of one of these things. Now, you can get kind of screwy there. Um, there are things that are listed, for instance, Kafka. Kafka uh, is advertised as a pub sub. One could look at it and say, well, JMS, I've learned about pub subs, but it acts and works in such a completely different way that you could be misled. You could call it a pub sub, but it acts really, really different. And you're going to be interested in, with Kafka in data retention as a management mechanism that you tend to not be as concerned about in a true pub sub. So there are some things to weed out. But knowing some friends, networking, networking becomes a very important part of architecture. So it's an element of what you would need to do. Notice it's soft skills. You're a rock star architect, uh, developer. You don't have to talk to anybody. People can feed you pizza, right? You can work all night long. That's not an architect, generally, right? Not, a, not an extremely good one. Uh, you need to know an element of infrastructure. What is a DNS? Uh, what, is, what is a, um, uh, why can't I think? Uh, the DMZ. What is a DMZ? What's its value? Those are the things that you're going to need to know. Now here, we're going to get into a, a, a quick debate for a second. What, one of the arguments that you'll have as we define architect, uh, it comes from the fact that uh, what well, we could define it as I defined it, non-functional requirements. Or you might be in a company that says you're an architect. In other words, it's a label. It's a title. 
right? And sometimes we'll leverage these titles in really interesting ways. Well, I need to pay you more because you're really good, and we ran, you're, you're already a senior uh, developer, so we will make you a junior architect. Right? That doesn't really change things, right? So with that said, one of the challenges that we have is I truly believe that as a good architect, you need to know all the things we're talking about. But you may work for an organization that is a financial institution. And in that world, you may be hypersensitive to security. You may have a whole team of people working on security, which means you as the software architect have less to do with the security architecture you just interface with a team that does. And so we have, very, as an architect for one company, moving to another company, moving to another company, the things that you might be engaged on could vary largely based on how you disseminate these roles. But for me, all of these roles are possible and frankly probably should be well understood as a good architect. And of course, of course it takes time to digest all of these things, right? It will take time. You will lean on people. It'll be soft skill oriented. Um, I only bring this up in that uh, it seems to me that the most, the, the largest change agent for uh, development processes, it's almost never the project manager. They usually follow a process. It's almost always a strong developer or an architect. Um, so it's worth bringing up and talking about. You're providing leadership. You're coaching. Now this gets, starts getting into some really interesting soft skill stuff. Uh, whether, if you're a good architect, you're gonna have dev team or dev people coming up and saying, hey, I don't understand this. Help me, help me understand your vision. Why do we do this? Oh, you know what? I love to put junior people on my team if I can control it. Love it, right? Now I don't want somebody who doesn't know software, but I want junior people. Why? They're gonna ask you really stupid questions. <laughs> We can't say that, right? But, but, we're, but I love it. I love it. Why? Because they're going to challenging. They're going to challenge me on the assumptions that are just second nature to me, and, and I'm going to have to be able to provide an answer to them. And two things happen at the same time. One is they begin to learn more. Two is I begin to learn more. Is the assumption that I'm making still valid today? Does it still make sense within this context? And can I explain it in a simple enough way to convey it to this developer? And if I can't, then I am probably not in the right position. Or I don't know enough, I need to figure it out. Right? Those, all, those things are true. And it's, a, it's a, an extremely valuable tool is to just add a junior developer to your team. Right? Now, I don't want a whole team of junior developers. <laughs> that would be a challenge. Uh, you're kind of the quarterback, which means you're not just coaching, you're actually in the game. You're actually part of the success criteria of this project. It's an important element. Uh, you're the change agent, as I mentioned. In fact, one of the uh, phrases I tend to like is, uh, uh, you need to change your organization or change your organization. <laughs> All right. But you're also the visionary, and I, I really ha harp on this quite a bit. Um, I'm not going to focus too much here on stage today unless you ask me to. Uh, here's, you know, you know what? I, uh, as I started my career and uh, I was my first job as a consultant, I worked for an organization. It was in the coal mining uh, business. And uh, by the way, the, the business model for coal really wasn't about coal. The problem we were trying to solve was trains. It was fascinating. Trains. And everybody had a nickname on the team. But when you first start, nobody knows what to call you, right? What's your nickname? But eventually, I got a nickname. And my nickname was Theory Boy. <laughs> and if there was one uh, tidbit of information I wish I could convey to the younger me, right? It would be stop trying to, to make software uh, so resilient that you don't have to change it for 10 years or 20 or ever. Right, that, that, that uh, I think I spent a lot of time trying to make that a, a, a success criteria for me or for my team that I don't know if it added as much value as I had thought it would. So, and, I, and actually the interesting thing here is that I was insanely theoretical. I grew eventually to be very practical and pragmatic. 
And I kind of still oscillate, right? But my oscillations are super tight now. And that's just through experience and time. I don't know how to get you there without going through the path. If there's another way, I don't know it. All right, but that's... But conveying a vision is super, super important. I think it's the critical part. Uh, in fact, one interesting story, I had a, a member of my team writing some code. This is a completely different project a couple years later. And I was like, well, what, where is that running? And we were doing some kind of client server architecture thing. I was like, I, I couldn't tell if it was running at the client or running at the server. And he didn't know. <laughs> and I was like, all right. Yeah, so someone didn't set the right vision for things. Like, the context is super important. It's very, very important. In fact, I don't tend to talk about it in this talk, but it's worth bringing up now. Uh, there are some great scientists in the 70s called the Dreyfus Brothers who created the Dreyfus model, and they said there's five uh, levels of skill acquisition for humans. Uh, it's novice, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, and expert. Uh, it is, through some literature that I've read in, in the recent past, uh, it is expected that 80% of our industry is advanced beginner. That's level two. We're, we're mostly advanced beginners. What is the most important thing about an advanced beginner? Uh, advanced beginners absolutely need recipes. What do we do when we first bring on new technology into an organization? Well, we can't have everybody just, we can't have the Wild West. We better organize these people, right? And what do we do? We create this amazing thing called best practices. You haven't even had a practice. How the heck do you know what a best practice is? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but you create them, why? Now, the cool part is, is we don't actually put it all together as to what we're doing. But what we're doing is we're creating recipes. We're creating recipes to enable the advanced beginners. Now, here's another thing that's really interesting. Uh, you will often have the competent or uh, expert people helping you create the best practices. That's who you're going to lean on to do that. But as you start to enforce the best practice, because the expert deviated in some way, and they know what they're doing, they know why they did it, but they're now being judged by something they created, which is kind of funny. <laughs> uh, you're going to push them out of your organization. They're no longer going to feel satisfied in being there, and you're going to be left all with advanced beginners that absolutely require recipes. It's a self-sustaining cycle that you will get into. Um, so it's a fascinating thing. Vision, it's a super important element of what we're going for. Translator, I can't tell you, this is where it's all at really. It's where a lot of it's at. This is both ways. I'm translating for the business, I'm translating to developers. I'll give you a, gr a great example. I was working for the state of Missouri in the United States uh, doing a tax-based uh, system. Fascinating thing, this was early 2000s. I recently went out to the website to see how it changed. It's the same thing I, my team created years and years ago. So that could be good or bad. I, I guess it works. <laughs> That's great. But Cindy was the director of, uh, called Dollar, D, uh, Department of Revenue, essentially. And she said that I want to be able to have a page. Now, we're doing taxes. So it's an employer's responsibility to pay the taxes in that country and state. Uh, I want an employee, their first name, last name, social security number, what they paid last quarter, and what they're paying this quarter. So that's the general idea. And the requirement was, I want them all on the same page. I'm like, first of all, that seemed like a really strange request. Right? I, I, I don't know what the drivers are, and this is one of those things. I need to translate. Help me understand why you want that. Help me understand why you say this. I'm going to keep digging because I need to understand the context of things. Now, in her world, what was fascinating was that uh, she wanted to make sure there was no duplicates and things like this. I'm like, it's a computer. We can, we can automate that. <laughs> and she was so insistent. Now, here's where things get really interesting. There's a lot of companies, a lot of consultants that you would have hired that would have just done what you told them to do. And you would have felt good about it. You would have said, you told me to do this. I said we shouldn't, and you said we should. What I did instead was, uh, first of all, in the state of Missouri, and it might be hard to, to understand the context in here, uh, any guesses as to how many employees the, uh, the company Walmart has in the state of Missouri back in 2004? 
it was 45,000, okay, 45,000. So uh, could you imagine 45,000 lines of one HTML page with all the data that I just described to you and what that experience might be like? So what I did instead was I created, I didn't create an application, I just scripted something that created a mocked up page of exactly what we would expect and said, Cindy, could you open this? And it took like five, 10 minutes for this page to open up on our Windows machine. And I said, look, that's no uh, back-end server computation. That's no uh, serialization across the network. That's probably not a great experience. What do you think? <laughs> right? And that's how I enabled change because it's more important to do the right thing, not what they tell you. They oftentimes don't know what is best for them. And I know that sounds weird. And I know that you've been told otherwise. The customer is always right. That's not true. It's not true, all right? I have to translate the consequences of things to the user. That's my job. They don't understand technology. I am there to help them understand. And when they understand the consequences, then they get to make the decisions, and I will abide by it, right? That's, that's the other part of the contract. I will do as long as they truly understand the consequences. The problem is that Cindy didn't understand, and I helped her understand. All right, you're setting standards. Uh, you're the technical ninja. <laughs> Threw in some fun ones, but a kind of a technical judge. At some point, you're going to have some debate as to what's the right approach for something, and you may have to draw the line. Say we're going this approach. In fact, I had a, a, a an individual, an architect. For him, everything was a GMS solution. Everything. <laughs> he was so fun to work with. <laughs> And uh, you know what? In fact, that brings to mind this. Whenever you see two architects arguing, it has been my assessment that uh, it, at least when you have respectful people, um, and I've been fortunate enough that's most common, uh, that oftentimes when there's a disagreement, the core of the disagreement is uh, they're arguing about different levels of scale. There is a time at a certain level of scale where GMS is likely the answer. But at, a, at another level of scale, with I'm dealing with a few hundred uh, concurrent users, it would be an overhead and a burden and a cost to the system that isn't warranted. In fact, one of my favorite things about eBay is when they have architectural choices that they're making, they categorize those choices and they say, this is business, and or business critical, and this is not. And it may sound strange and odd, but one of the things that's not business critical is registration of a user. Uh, they do not put any extra energy or effort into building in any extra nines, uh, one of the fun architectural terms, right? Uh, any more fault tolerance in software for user registration. They use kind of a stateful, um, like a JS, I don't know if it's JSF or not, but it's something similar to that because it's easy and quick to develop. It's easy to maintain. And they have enough nines given by their hardware that they don't focus on the software, which is very strongly different than when they're dealing with bids, auction bids. Auction bids is their business. They will always be ordered appropriately. They will always be idempotent, which is a really hard architectural concept to get for most developers. They will always succeed, and they will always be ordered correctly. That is a core part. So making a decision of I'm going to invest in this and not that. And, and, and the many architects, especially junior ones, would say, oh, I want, uh, I want a homogenous system. I want it all to be nines. I want all the nines possible for all the things. That's crazy talk. All right? that, that may be what you read about, but that's not the real world. Right? <laughs> all right. Oh, politician. Yeah. Do you know you are going to, as an architect, you are going to have to be a, a politician? And I'm sad. I don't, this is not my favorite part. I was working at a large uh, financial institution. I won't bring up their name, but the experience was priceless. <laughs> and I was asked, I, I started a new project I was the architect on, and uh, they had just spent $3 million on a, on a, on a software system called Pegasystems, which is a workflow system. And the question that was given to me was, Ken, uh, I know it wasn't originally thought this way, but is it possible that you could make this system work on Pega? You're just starting out. This is the perfect time to evaluate this. What do you think? 
Now, you shouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> can, can I do this? I can do anything. <laughs> I can make that work. It would just be stupid. Right? It would not be uh, advantageous. Now, you have to you know, think, why? Why did they ask me this? It's really easy. They spent $3 million. Some VP signed off on $3 million. And you know what makes that VP look good? That it's useful for more things than they envisioned. And if I can make this fit on that, they go, oh, see, we're, we're adding value. This thing was well worth it, and I'm looking really good as the VP. That's politics. So what do I have to do? Now, I have a policy where I just don't, I don't lie. I'm not going to mislead. I'm not going to say, no, it's not possible, because I know it's possible. I start to have to play political games at that point. Mm. It, you know, it is possible, but it's, I, you know, I estimate it to be maybe twice the amount of money and time in order to produce that relative to what we were going to do. And you start playing these games, and it's not a satisfying place to be, frankly. But I have to truly give them the consequence of things. Again, I'm translating, and it becomes political. And sometimes you lose that. And I, yeah, it's frustrating. It's the real world, though, right? All right. And then all the illity of things. All the other things, right? All the other things. <laughs> I don't know what's in the sign. <laughs> all right. So often we're biting off more than we can chew. I can't tell you the amount of times where I have felt overwhelmed by uh, what I have taken on as a responsibility, but I have grown from it. The, the talent and, the, and the, the challenge is to know when it's excessive and when, uh, when it's actually making you stretch. Right? That's the true uh, challenge. How do we get architects? Well, it seems like programmers become senior programmers, and then you have to make a choice, right? Now, most of the time, it depends on culture. I understand the culture here oftentimes is people will put off even getting married until you're a man. Like, there's a certain status. <laughs> uh, which is cool. I'm, I'm not against that. Uh, here's the thing for me. I actually have become uh, an architect. And this may sound strange, but I've recently reintroduced myself. So I made a choice like five years ago. I always want to code. Uh, I, I would code if someone didn't pay me, I would code. And uh, I got into, back into a job where as a, I'm a software engineer again. Uh, but I have the skills that I learned as an architect, and that gives me a, a lot of advantages, I think. Uh, but it's very common that we're pushed into project management or architect, and it's oftentimes driven by status. It's oftentimes driven by money, and that's all reasonable things. But I think you can make a, uh, a lot of money still as a good de developer if that's what you really want to do. And if you want to enjoy life. Or maybe soft skills are something that you're really good at and you want to do that. There's really great value in it. Just know. Just know for yourself who you are and who you want to be. Uh, and then and go forward with that. There's so much opportunity in the world. And it's just growing. There are so many things that, uh, that we're going to see in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So with that, let's talk about aspects of architecture. <clears throat> You know, I threw together a few things that I kind of want to, I, I do want to get some responses from you guys on. Um, oftentimes, you're looking at some of these illities, and one of the popular ones is coupling, right? And, and, and we have really a spectrum of things. We have tight coupling and loose coupling. And the question I have for you is, which is better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I ask this worldwide, and I get the same response, generally speaking, and the response is loose. And I want to talk about it for a second. Uh, it, 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 what, what if, just a theory, right? What if the world is so tightly coupled, and th there's a spectrum of possibilities, that uh, generally speaking, when we look at the majority of software projects, that we are too tightly coupled, and we're saying, look, we should go that way. We should definitely go that way. And so almost everything we read or discuss leads us to the assumption that we should probably be going that way. What would you imagine would happen if all the software projects that we're dealing with were so loosely coupled? What would we hear then? Go that way. Go that way. <laughs> what does it depend on? What does it depend on? Whoa. <laughs> Were you guys just enlightened, or was that just me? <laughs> All right. I don't know sometimes. 
Well, I'm going to talk about coupling again. I've got a slide for it, all right? But uh, I want you to put that in the back and, and let the background thread process that for a second. Is that always the best thing? Is it always the best thing? I have found through my own experience, and this is in life in general, that there is rarely ever like the answer, the one answer. Life is significantly much more complex than that in general. Uh, I also think that we often as humans like simple answers. I happen to like stocks and what will often happen is we'll hear the news, all oh, the stocks fell today because, and they'll have some one answer, right? <laughs> China is backing out of some car company. Boom, we're all gonna lose money, right? It's ridiculous, but the human psyche loves it, right? They're like, oh, I have a reason to blame something. And then I'm done. I don't have to think anymore. And if there's a time and a place to think is as an architect, truly thinking about it. Like, what does it mean? What is it? It's not an answer. There's nothing automatic. It's not just loose. There's something that's driving it. And why? What do I gain from it? And what's the consequence of it? Is it does it cost less or more? And does it cost less or, or, or does it cost more now, but I gain it's cheaper long term? There's so many questions, right? There's so many questions. All right, complexity. I'll have another slide on this one, accidental versus essential. There are times when things are just complex. It, it, you, it's inescapable. Uh, and, and at that point, it, I don't even know if I like the term complexity. It's, uh, in fact, I used to like to break up the term complicated, hard, and uh, complex, because they're very strongly different, but in the English language, we sometimes kind of make them sound the same. And oftentimes, people will look at something, especially somebody who's junior, and say, that's complex or complicated. And what they really mean is, that's not familiar to me. Right? It's not familiar to me. And once you became familiar with it, in fact, you would go, oh, yeah, well, that's not what I'm going to choose to use, but I get it. All right. uh, flexibility, anytime you add flexibility, you add complexity. Uh, in fact, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. All right. So the evolution of architecture, just a quick tour, right? We just want a simple solution. We're going to create something that's going to be web-based. We need Apache and Java there. As we start to evolve things, we're like, oh, yeah, you know what? I kind of want this to be fault tolerant, <laughs> right? Or I need to be able to scale it, so I'm going to load balance across three sets of things. And now all of a sudden, the thing that was easy because I have all the state managed in Tomcat now has to be spread across and I have to figure things out. In fact, for a second, let's pause, right? The whole world in the architecture world is like screaming stateless. Stateless, 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 right? Microservices and stateless. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what does that mean, stateless? There are services that are kind of stateless. DNS makes a good example. I do a look up. Hey, if I ask you for this name, can you give me an IP? That seems awesome. There is always state, right? Other than the simplest of cases, there is always state to manage. Uh, I can't think of uh, real world examples of software solutions that don't have some state somewhere. If you, have, if you have a simple shopping cart, you have to manage at some location, some place, what is the thing that's being ordered, what's being put into the cart. And then somebody's going to hit an order button and then you're going to process. And that might be a, a stateless process. But here's the deal. You're either managing state at the client or you're managing state at the back end. And you may have stateless services that are going to uh, work on those, but at some point I have to get it from the, from the client. So if I store state at the back end, not at the middle tier, but at the back end, I have a little cookie, some kind of token that represents that state. And then I'm going to serialize that cookie and I'm going to reconstitute that state at the back end so that I can then process on it. So when we say stateless, what we mean is I'm going to, stick, I'm going to serialize data. That's what we're saying. And the serialization of data will kill you. It will kill scale. So you have to be really careful with it. And then we can talk about add to the conversation of, security, uh, of uh, architecture security. Do you trust the end client with that data? And how can you? It's complicated, right? There's things to think about. And then we're like, you know what? We have logged in users. Let's move the users out of the database and put them into an LDAP store. OK, things start to evolve a little bit further. And then you're like, you know what? I need to be able to have a region uh, on Amazon go out and still be working. So I need to put this in multiple regions, which also means that I need to replicate data across multiple regions. Uh, and, and we keep evolving this further and further. This is a kind of style we tend to see very commonly. 
All right. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, you know what? This is actually, I want to pause for a second. How I can tell the maturity of a given application when I'm on the ground at a client site is uh, looking at whether they have analytics, looking at whether they have logging and what style of logging, uh, and, and how they're managing performance and uh, SLAs, or service level agreements. Because it tends to be that's the last thing that gets added into a set of applications. Uh, at, at some point, I have a functional thing, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I have logs, but they're all at that server, and I want to be able to query through them. So I need to add in Splunk or the Elk stack or something, right? I need some way of managing it at an enterprise level. It tends to be uh, at the tail end. So the same thing similarly true with open source. Open source tooling tends to leave out security until the very last moment. And so when they have security elements added into open source tooling, you know that they've reached a certain level of maturity that didn't exist prior to that. Um, system integration, something beautiful about a tank and a church integrated together. <laughs> Can't believe I find slides like that sometimes. All right, so again, some thoughts. Um, this three, t you know, it was funny when I first started doing client server development, I was like, they kept, it was a big fad at some point, and my friends and I were, de, de, you know, coding and talking. It's like, what is this thing? And then we realized six months later that we've been doing it, right? It's just a weird world to be in. Uh, so the whole idea is we have these uh, departments that create silos, and you have a couple of silos, and you need to be able to bridge across them, and there's a couple of techniques in looking at that. But this is how we're visioning things, right? Well, the problem is, is that you look across the bridge, and, well, you know, it might go all the way through. Uh, you, and you start to look at architecture diagrams that look like this, uh, and we have an N plus one problem uh, as we start to have these silos that need to talk to everything. And you imagine this growing as an architect. You're like, you're thinking this thing's going to grow. So you imagine growth. And you do have growth, but it's not exactly how you imagined it. <laughs> One of the challenges that you have is this. Um, as a, at a CTO level, the C-suite of, of, uh, of a company, they might be uh, looking at diagrams that look like this. And they're like, wow, that's better. This looks better, right? It's a better diagram. And, you know, often, to, like in, in the, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was an ESB. Um, it, we, we keep coming up with things that represent that. And it's gone by a number of different names. But the complexity is still there. It's just virtualized. And you need to find the right tooling in order to enable that. Currently, one of the best solutions kind of in that space, in fact, and it doesn't fix all of the things, because at this point, you're looking at integration of application to application across uh, services. Uh, but, but, but definitely kind of in this category is Kafka, where I'm going to decide I'm just going to have a stream of data all go to one data repository, and then I'm going to read off of that uh, source of truth to a number of other data repositories uh, for whatever purpose they have. And, and instead of making connections at, a, at an API layer, I make it at a data layer. So we, we've seen that cycle a number of times going back and forth out of that. But it's not a, a bad choice. Let's talk about coupling. I mentioned uh, tight versus loose. I want you to do a thought experiment with me. What is the loosest possible API that we can imagine written in Java? And I'll start us out. It says public. What's the return type of this function? Object, OK, thank you. And then we're going to say execute something, invoke, you know, whatever. What do we pass it? Uh, there's a couple of options, right, probably. Uh, it depends on whether you want to be Java-centric or not. One could imagine maybe a hash map or an array. But how about just a, uh, whoops, click, an object array. We got some args. Now, I have a question for you. What would it feel like, what would it be like if every class in the JDK had this as its interface? <laughs> it would be awesome. It'd be loosely coupled. This is exactly what we want. You guys just said it. We want loose. <laughs> now, with experience, right, we begin to learn a few things. Uh, it, oh, in fact, oh, one more, and then I'll, and I'll finish that thought. Uh, your first thoughts, just instantly. How many, how many different levels of abstractions do you see? How many? Just like right off, what did you see? What was the number? Two. Uh, worldwide, for I've had this slide for more than uh, 10, 15 years. For worldwide, everybody says two. 
And I, I'm not sure what it is about the human mind or experiences that drives that. I, I'm assuming things like electrical things or electronic things and animal things. Right? Now I want, a, 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 let's go further with this experiment. Could you see one? What would it be called? Icon? Maybe? Yeah. Image? Picture? Things? Like there's a couple, it depends. Could you see six gather all their own unique things, right? And now the most important question, what does it depend on? What level of abstraction, yes. What, so the, que the follow-up question is, what does the level of abstraction depend on? Someone said it. I love that you guys are thinking it through with me. I really do. It depends on context. What is the context that we are dealing with? Right? What is the problem we're solving? What is the context of the problem? You can't lose it. You can't lose it. Uh, I don't have the slide to represent this, uh, or I would show it to you. I was working for an organization, and uh, they had, we, we, we were doing a bunch of XML. We had some POJOs that needed to go to XML. Uh, somebody was given a recipe <laughs> and a bunch of people, junior people, took that recipe and duplicated it over and over again and they created on every object instead of a two string, a two XML string, <laughs> all right? And the two XML string uh, did a couple of things but what, what the most significant thing is it concatenated um, essentially field level variables, uh, essentially state of that object, concatenated it with, um, with brackets and when I say concatenation, I mean a string concatenation, right? Now, of course, I looked at it because they asked me to. <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> this is bad. You know what I heard back? Ken, we have a lot of pressure. It's already done and it works, right? Have, are you familiar with this? Is this something you might have heard? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Great, we're together. <laughs> and I said, okay, great. I, I, I said, you know what? I love the fact that you have unit tests and that you have testing going on. Will you do me a favor? Sure. Would you let me write one more test? <laughs> now, did they create XML? They did. They did. Here's the thing. How often does this happen? We will do a code review. We will have human eyeballs looking at code. What is the most common thing that I tend to hear during a code review? Why did you name this variable this? Wouldn't it be better if you did this? Could you rename that exception to something more declarative? <laughs> right? I'm like, yes, I could, <laughs> but I'm not going to. <laughs> now, I want you to think, because you remember those five models, the skill levels, the Dreyfus model, right? The review of code of a level one or level two coder is going to be things like that. They're going to go, this deviates from the recipe. This recipe, this recipe could be improved a little bit by naming things a little bit better. What are they missing? At the higher orders of things, the fours and fives, you know what they're doing? They're looking at it and going, what is the purpose of this code? What context does it fit in and does it serve that context? Right? Because what we're generating is XML. And an expert wouldn't go, oh, you could cat it in strings and get in some XML representation. They would go, there are rules to XML. And the rules say that there are certain allowable characters, and then there are other characters for which they have to be escaped or managed specially. And I have to be able to have a tool set or a library that does that appropriately for me. I can't just evade the rules. So junior people are, seem to be ruleless. Like they, 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 you give them recipes and all they know is to follow the recipe. They're not looking at it beyond the recipe. And what we need is context. And the context defines how many levels of abstractions that you have. It's a super important concept, right? Going back to decoupling, 
It used to be, I, I started out coding on the Windows platform. It's kind of funny now because I haven't touched, I don't, I don't even know how to use Windows anymore. It's kind of comical. But back then we had COM and DCOM. And in the COM world, we had these COM objects and they had what was referred to as a dual interface. And all that meant is I had an interface called iUnknown and iDispatch. An iUnknown was something that you could query and say, what are the things that you can do? What functions do you serve? And the iDispatch is invoke this feature. It is as loose as they come. They commonly had a feature called a dual interface. And what a dual interface meant is this is essentially a DLL. And this DLL could be tightly bound or it could be loosely bound. What do you think was the most common way of integrating with a COM object? It was very tightly bound. Why do we tightly bind to things? We tightly bind to things because we have the lowest level of latency. And there are certain levels of abstraction, especially within a component, within a package, within a module for which it's highly desirable to reduce the amount of latency that you would have. When you're dealing with uh, a highly, high rates of change, uh, completely different life cycles of components, now I need to honor that. Assuming that I, I can't deviate from it, I'm going to honor it by saying I need to loosely bind to these things. When do we see loose binding in the comm world? Well, when I had a tool that was generic, or when I had a bridging technology, I would bridge comm to CORBA, and, I would and I, there are things I just didn't know at the time of compilation. And I would figure out at runtime instead, and I would do that through a very loose interface. So there's huge value in honoring tightly bound things and loosely bound things, and it once again depends on context and what you're after. I would uh, repeat that having everything loosely bound would be a nightmare. Because once I'm loosely bound, going back to the invoke object on Java, what do you have to do? What I have to do is write a bunch of documentation. I would have endless Java docs that would say the number of uh, arguments that are possible for this invoke would be these things. And I would have to read through all these documentations and it would take humans to do that. I wouldn't have tooling that would understand that. I'd be forced down a really bad path. Instead, I have a very declarative, very static environment, a strongly typed environment that allows me to understand it at an API level and my tooling can help me. That's where we get the awesome IntelliSense where I hit a space bar and magic happens, right? It's awesome. Also true at an architectural level. I've, I've been talking pretty low. At an architectural level, these things are also true. So I was talking with a friend some time ago, and I said, you know what? Architecture's a lot like playing Dungeons and Dragons. And they said, no one's going to know that, Ken. No one's going to understand you. <laughs> no one knows what D&D &D is anymore. You guys know D&D, &D, right? No? Uh, some people do. So I switched it to the world of Warcraft. Right? which is a huge change, of course. <laughs> I believe architecture is just like this. You know, you're going into battle, and you're going into a cave, and you've got your plus two to dark magic sword, but it also has a negative against uh, light and a negative. That's what architecture is. Everything has a consequence. So here's an example. Let's say I'm trying to add security, so I'm going to go plus two to security. I promise you, that a, uh, any increase in security is a reduction in user experience, always. It's a very important concept. What does a user ask you? They're like, you know what, I'm tired of signing in multiple times. Could you make you know, this single sign-on thing work for me? I say, well, you want me to create a service that trusts another service so that you can benefit from not being authenticated again, right? Yeah, I'm like, all right. <laughs> So you have a reduction in user experience. If you have enough security added on, you'll have a reduction in performance. Um, you'll uh, usually increase uh, complexity and things of this nature. Same thing I mentioned, single sign-on. A distributed, uh, a highly versionable distributed services, super, super complex. What is everybody trying to do with microservices? I want to create a microservice where I could change something and nothing else is affected <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> good luck. It's going to be a 
It's going to be a lot of money, a lot of time. It, you, that could be your life's mission. You could just stay on that forever. <laughs> Would like to see the thesis on that. <laughs> So um, I don't know how to avoid the experiences. I think they add uh, tremendous value. In fact, what I would say, I was just talking with Neil Ford uh, b before this talk, and I said, you know, uh, uh, one of the other things I would say to the younger me, right? I have learned that there are very few people that truly, truly know. And I know that sounds weird, right? There are very few people that are the source of truth. There are a lot of people who are maybe professors, teachers that parrot the, the truth. And they're, in many cases, they're smart. And they're at least smart enough to know that they trust the, the source, right? That's awesome. And uh, what I would tell the younger me is forget the money. I mean, it'll come and you, sh and you should worry about it. You have to have a rice bowl, right? That's important. I get that. But go, if you find somebody who's the source, and I have someone in my life that's like that. I, I, I have other responsibilities that's kind of, that's just what I was talking with Neil about. I was like, I have other responsibilities that at my stage of life makes it challenging to do what I would recommend. And that is, I would just go be their right hand man. I would find out, I would just work for them. I would work for them until I know what they know, right? A great example in history, in fact, is Faraday. Michael Faraday is world known for magnetics and for uh, oh, lots of things in the electronics world. He worked for a brilliant man called, I think it was Davies. Uh, and no one knows him, but everybody knows Faraday. And uh, there's some interesting history there that's worth looking into. Uh, I'm not saying you would become the next Faraday. I'm just saying there's really good reasons to work with people who truly know and understand. Right? Does that make sense? Got really solemn here for a second. You guys okay? <laughs> I don't mean to be the wise guy, but <laughs> let's talk about complexity. <laughs> it is possible to make the problem hard. <laughs> right? In fact, there's an interesting question that comes with this, right? And the question is, is you decide you're going to put a wall in here, put another office in that building, and you need to put another line in there. And the question is, does it matter? <laughs> does it matter where you put that line? <laughs> I don't think it does. <laughs> Turns out that um, I'm a pilot, and this is the plane that I co-own with a couple of people in the U.S. Um, by the way, anybody coming to the, uh, the U.S. that uh, hooked, you know, to get my email, we'll go flying. It'll be fun. But the thing that I'm bringing up is this. There are a lot of people who will look at this, which would be the front end of the cockpit, and go, dang, that's complex. And I look at it and go, I, I, you know, uh, I don't know what I'd pull out. Uh, there is some redundancy. There's definitely uh, multiple comms. There's multiple uh, nav devices. Uh, and what I would say is your lack, uh, your expectation that that's complex really is driven by the fact that you're not familiar. And, and it's less to do with functionality. You're just not familiar. I'm telling you, if you get 100 hours behind this cockpit and you are the one making knobs move because you know what they do and you become familiar with them, you would go, yeah. Of course, you know, throw me in the next plane. <laughs> so there's huge value. Make sure that you're focused on what is essential. Uh, and don't confuse the lack of familiarity with complexity. And that can be hard. Be, in fact, I was going to say this to the end, but the hardest thing uh, in being an architect, the, uh, from my perspective, the hardest thing is being aware. Being aware, and I don't know how to convey that. It's, it's, it's really that simple, but it's really hard. In fact, let me give you a simple example of that, and then we'll move forward. I, uh, there, there's levels of scale for which the rules change. You remember, we talked about rules. You, you have to be aware of the rules. You understand the context of things. But there are things that can happen, like changing the level of scale that change the rules. And here's the problem. You put in, you built this really great architecture, it's working really, really well, you've got uh, multiple data stores that you're trying to keep consistent, so you put in an XA compliant two-phase commit system, right, you, and it's, it's working. It's been working for a couple of years, and you're happy. <laughs> and then you start having some challenges, some scalability issues, you start digging into it, 
And here's what will happen, because you're going to fight it. You're going to fight the awareness. You're going to go, mm, you know what? If we, can find, if we can tune this to be a little bit quicker, if we can change the data structure just a tad, if we can do this, you, you keep playing with trying to optimize with the old rules. Because you haven't been convinced yet that the rules have completely changed and you have to do something else. And I'll, I promise you this, and I, I've said this a number of times, I've literally had someone laugh at me. And I thought, it, it, it was kind of offensive when it first happened to me, and now I, I just, it's, I don't get offended. I think it's funny uh, to a certain extent. When I get laughed at about it, I'm like, oh, it, it, it clearly, your level of awareness is somewhere different than mine, and that's okay. It, it, it truly is, right? But I promise you, there's a level of scale for which XA compliant two-phase commit will not work. It will completely fail. There is, it's not possible. Right? Why? It's actually fairly simple. When you are trying to keep consistent two different uh, repositories, the way we do it with the XA compliant two-phase commit transaction is we have kind of a voting process. Hey, we're about to commit. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, let's do this. There's a coordination that is happening that's very chatty and it's network chatty. It's network chatty. And at some level of scale, it will always fail because cap theorem is real, <laughs> which means consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And the reality is in today's world, is certainly a, a microservices-based architecture world, you already have a P. You know, we used to say cap theorem, consistency, availability, partition tolerance, you get two out of the three. You've already picked the P, you get one. <laughs> Do you want consistency or would you like things to be available? <laughs> That's all you get. Which means you know, what governs the world in the high scale world today is eventual consistency which means we care about availability over consistency, assuming that eventually it will become consistent, which is not an XA compliant thing. You can't, it doesn't work, right? So, and there are plenty of things like that. That's a really easy and good example to share. Uh, if you haven't had that experience, if two-phase commit works for you, that's awesome. I'm telling you, just like eBay uses like a component-based architecture for building UIs, they do it because it's cheaper. They do it because there's less money and it's not business. That is awesome. If you're using XA compliant transaction, that is awesome. It also means you're at a level of scale that supports it, which is great. Someday you are going to fight and resist the fact that the rules have changed, right? So being aware that the rules change is the hardest thing about being an architect, from my perspective. We'll get Vin Kat to share his perspective later, but he disappeared otherwise. <laughs> All right, scalability. We talk a lot about scaling things. It seems to be one of the top architectural topics. And uh, the thing that I always find funny is we, we talk about linear scale. I've never measured something to be linear, ever. All right, what I tend to measure is something that looks more like this. And I think this is a great diagram outside of I would change concurrent user to concurrent requests, but uh, and, and can you see somewhere on that curve where things are linear? Yeah, you know, before the dashed line, everything seems linear. At some point, we start curving things, right? This, and, and the cool thing is, and this at least has been true for me, if you're looking at a box, you'll get a curve that looks like that. You'll have a buckle zone. Now, if you want to get into abstractions, the buckle zone always happens for the same reason, <laughs> uh, which is funny to say, actually, right? Always happens for the same reason. You have tapped out a resource. Now, the hard part is, what is the resource? <laughs> is it memory? Is it cores? Uh, is it virtual or physical? Uh, do you have a thread pool that you've tapped out? That's a virtual thing, right? There are things you can do where as you increase scale, you start to hit this buckle zone. The other really cool thing is this curve exists here on this machine. And as, as you start to load balance across multiple machines, the curve exists now at a system level instead of a node level. And it, now I can share with you like one of my favorite quotes from eBay. From, uh, there's an architect, uh, I don't know if he works there anymore, but uh, Randy Shope used to work for eBay. They had a mantra, and the mantra was, if you can't split it, you can't scale it. Scaling things about splitting things. And once you find the thing that you can't split, 
for whatever reason, you now know your bottleneck, you now know the thing that limits your scale. All right, but splitting is a necessary element. As we split a node that curves like this into multiple nodes, we now have a curve that's elongated based on the system level. Now what happens at a, at a cluster level, I start to see this buckle zone again. What do I do? Well, we know we have to split it, right? How do we do that? I've already split it by a load balancer. What do I do now? Well, if you've ever logged on to Hotmail, right? Uh, if you've ever logged on to something like that, as soon as you log on, you go to a subdomain. So now you can split out traffic based on subdomains instead of load balancing. They each have their own load balancer and cluster behind it. Always about splitting. Always about splitting. Uh, I'm going to run out of time, so serialization, it's a killer. Uh, <laughs> don't do it, no. <laughs> security, um, one thing I would say about security is do it up front. Uh, one of my favorite lessons learned in the last few years, uh, it maybe introduce abuse cases. Uh, what that may, means is take a use case, all of your use cases, and create an abuse case for that use case. How would somebody uh, gain access or leverage data inside that use case in an appropriate way? That way you have an abuse case built in up front as part of the design. It's an interesting idea. We talked about usability and, scale, uh, and security. What's the most secure system you can imagine? What does it look like? It's, it's turned off. Right? <laughs> That's very secure. <laughs> you turn it on, certain level of risks are engaged, right? <laughs> uh, my favorite book is getting older, but I happen to really love this book, uh, Writing Secure Code by Michael Howard and David LeBlanc. Uh, a, a warning to you, Michael Howard has also written some other books that I don't think are good, so, uh, but this one is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> So the point here is that, you know, if we're trying to get to a point of wisdom and understanding, like there's certain skills that we, have, we need to have, right? There's a couple of approaches at it. I will have to say that my path has been the experience and less the, 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 uh, the more noble approaches. But, uh, but there's some good out of it. I feel like I'm in a good place. Uh, I want to emphasize this awareness. I've talked about it already. The hardest part about being a good architect is being aware uh, understanding and knowing when the rules changed. And with that, <clears throat> there's a bunch of stuff we didn't talk about. I personally think user experience as an element of architecture. Uh, how you scale has a huge impact on the user experience. We didn't talk anything about data and data models. We didn't talk anything about containers. Uh, okay, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff to know. There really is. Uh, I would hyper-focus for your, if you're an architect on your project, of understanding and being aware of what are the most important things. What are, the, what are the balls you can't drop? You know, pick three. Say, these are the most important things. And I'm going to become an expert at these three things for the best of my company and my team. That's what I would focus on. And with that, there's a few books that I highly recommend. Uh, release it as a friend of mine, Michael Nygaard. He's amazing. I recommend it mainly because Netflix changed significantly architecture and some of their projects uh, their chief architect required all of their architects to read that book. If it is endorsed in that way, it's probably worth checking out and making sure you understand it. Uh, probably the best microservices book uh, that you can uh, read is on there as well. Um, these are the ones that I would recommend. I'm sure there's other ones that are great out there. I'm not trying to narrow your focus. but um, And with that, hopefully you had a good trip, and thanks. <laughs>